Hi, everyone. Hope everyone can hear me. I'm Joel Silverstein, and I'm a founding member of the Jewish Art Salon, uh, one of the original members, and I'm involved with exhibitions and stuff like that. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. This is the Jewish Art Salon's open studio sessions. It's been a fantastic program run by, curated by uh, Judith Joseph, who is presenting today, and uh, Dorit Jordan Dontan, who are both friends of mine and wonderful artists, okay? Uh, also, there's a uh, special help, I have to check this, sorry. Uh, Yona, who could not be here today, I'm speaking in her stead, she had work today, so uh, she apologizes. Cheslin Amato, who is here today, and Kana Weisenthal Elias, also here today, has helped uh, with the proceedings, so thank you very much. Um, today's artists are Judith, who has been uh, instrumental in this whole program since the beginning, uh, Egal Permuth, who I, I don't know but met today, and he's an awesome artist, and Harriet Fink, who I also know for many years. So uh, I want to turn it back to the curators, and thank you very much for coming today. Thank you so much, Joel. Um, the next, I just want to mention that the next Open Studios program will be in January, but there is a, a, a Jewish Art Salon Zoom program on December 12th at the usual time, noon Eastern time. It's uh, a program that will be hosted by Jewish Art Salon members, Jonathan Homerighausen and Aaron Rosen, who's a curator. And Jonathan curated an exhibit um, about sacred calligraphy, including Hebrew works. And the Open Studios program is going to resume in January and we will announce the dates later. So today, as you know, we are going to present Harriet Fink and myself and Egal Permuth. Um, Dorit is going to put uh, links to the websites in the chat. So um, please type your questions for us into the chat as well. Dorit? Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so uh, the, you can see in the chat, you get the links for the website and you can write your questions on the chat. Uh, Harriet Fink is a New Jersey based artist. After practicing as an architect for several years, she turned to collage and painting. She has had solo and duo shows at galleries in New York and New Jersey and many group exhibitions. Her work is in corporate collections and her studio is located in Manufacturers Village, East Orange, New Jersey. She holds a master's degree in architecture from Harvard University. Harriet, it's all yours. The beginning of the COVID lockdown coincided for me with a planned surgery that would mean six weeks of rest. So I had a head start in experiencing a quiet introspective period. I just had no idea that I'd be joined by pretty much the whole world. Before the surgery, I gathered up watercolor paper and pen and ink to continue my drawing practice from home. At my studio, I prepped some cradled wood, a new material for me, with metallic paint, also new, for when I'd be able to return. I did know that I'd be taking a break from Jewish text-based art, and indeed, from art with any preconceived content. The pen and ink drawings would be a continuation of a series I had already begun of geometric abstractions and imaginary landscapes composed of tiny strokes with the tiniest of nibs. And they were done on a 14 by 16 inches paper. It's another one. COVID hit. My recuperation was submerged in the general anguish, the shrinking of our social lives, the refocus on simple homey rituals. Friends began to get sick, some died. A really close friend was taken. This is how the drawings morphed into geometric abstractions. Somewhere along the way, I began using some homey objects, bowls, bottle caps, to make my circles. Coins, jars, coffee tins. It was meaningful to do this. They were companions in this strange new life. I also turned to old drafting tools from my architecture days, which by now were antiques, relics of a vanished craft. I used them and then I drew them. I traced their edges, 
and let them appear to be ghosts, really. I noticed our alto vase. There go, yeah. With its signature shape, these fabulous curves. I found the cookie cutters. <laughs> the idea was to outline an object and draw in the space around it to delineate both presence and absence. Around the kitchen. My father's stapler, his pipe. This is not a pipe. <laughs> My grandfather's hammer. Garden tools, our carpenters square and level in the closet. my husband's stethoscope. I began to post these in a regular fashion on Instagram. I borrowed a collection of beautiful old kitchen carpentry and gardening tools from my friend whose husband had died of COVID. The drawings became a kind of memorial to him, outlining the beautiful, well-worn, well-used tools that had touched vegetables, butter, wood, metal, and dirt. They would certainly be about absence and presence. The sieve. So this is actually how I do it. Square. Love this one. It's a bark trimmer and an ax. And I did a series of found objects found on the street. So, and this you probably recognize. When I eventually returned to the studio, there was a group of gilded, silvered, and bronze surfaces waiting for me. Although I often work from a Jewish text, this time, COVID time, I had no wish to. The work would name itself or not. So this is what emerged. Something that resembled a map, lots of color and swarms of tiny circles, a floating isolated world. The metallic surface, I think gives it a timeless groundless quality like an early Renaissance picture. This one I call topo. These are about 24 by 36. As you can see, it's a diptych. And this one, this next one I call skein. Another group with simple colored grounds is meant to be arranged somewhat like this. As a group. They may be cellular, they may be molecular. They're organic shapes and playing, of course, with color. Another floating island or two. These are tiny. This one's about eight by 10 by eight, six by six. 
And now I return to the metallic grounds that I had pre-prepped. These are two large boards. I call it gears, gears one. Make of it what you will. Gears two, this one is uh, five feet by five feet. Watercolor paper. Another series on wood, on the metallic ground, on the flat ground, this one's called arc. And you can see it's dealing with space and flatness, but also so much else. I call this one Coney Island twist. It's a diptych as is the last one. A deep space, um, I think a lot of joy, but uh, also some uh, biological something here going on. And this, this is called firework, single panel, uh, 24 by 36. This one's called Terry's Fabric. It's based on a friend's photograph of Mexican embroidery. And again, it's kind of biomorphic, but also very, very joyous. And this is my current piece, um, may or may not be finished. I seem to be calling it octet. There's a lot going on here. It's uh, five and a half feet wide. It's uh, four and a half feet high. It's dealing with color, with darks and lights, with accident, with miracles, with repetition, with variations on a theme, exuberance, burgeoning life, I hope, beginnings. And I do assure you, my colleagues here at the Jewish Art Salon and any of my friends tuning in, that the text-based underpinnings of so much of my previous work are still there, just beneath the surface. Thank you so much to Dorit and Judith and to Joel for introducing this and for Yona in absentia. This is, this is really a, a great series. Thanks a lot. And Aria, thank you so much for this incredible uh, presentation. Your work is so uh, touching. I mean, the movement, the dynamic of it, it's just fantastic. Um, there are a lot of comments uh, on your work on the chat, so you can uh, see this after. And now everybody, anyone who wants to ask questions, there was uh, Meryl Silver who would like to ask something I saw in the chat. So please unmute yourself and just jump in. I'm just delighted to see Harriet's work. She's a new friend of mine and um, I love hearing the personal stories behind them. Thanks, Meryl. Thank you. It was, um, it was an opportunity during COVID to merge the personal with the public um, in a way that I'd, I'd never done before. It was a very introspective time Someone asked uh, how I do these things, uh, the, the drawings I work on a table and the paintings I work on a wall. It's pretty much it. So Barbara would like to ask about the medium, but you told us that there's our various there, so. Well, the other, just... uh, the other uh, answer about medium is that the paintings are done partly with gouache and partly with acrylic. Acrylic's my general go-to, but on the uh, sparkly surfaces, uh, the gouache was brighter. I have like Miriam has a question. Go ahead. Oh, hi, Miriam. <laughs> hi. Um, I love the presentation. The last piece that you did, to me, is similar to a lot of the other work that you've done in the past. But what I noticed is that the hard edge drawings and now also the paintings on board with the metallic a lot of them are hard edge, the arc painting. And now this one is kind of not, it's all over. Right. 
That's what happened or what were you thinking something, about? Something me? happened, something happened. Okay. And in fact, that last one is a redo. There are two other paintings under it. Something happened and I started to dissolve my lines. And in fact, it is. it does hark back to my stuff I'd done two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, but it's much more uh, melty. Something definitely happened. I, um, there was definitely a, a motion towards some blending and, and uh, dissolution. But even when I do the hard edge, the point is for the tiny pristine dots to meld or melt together. And that's true actually with the grounds of the drawings also. So there's a hard edge, but there's also softness going on somewhat. And Thank Doris you. Dittmer is asking about what was your biggest challenges in doing this? Well, uh, COVID, of course, and uh, I, keeping up a practice, starting a practice at home. I'd always worked in the studio, and it was actually very liberating to discover that I could work on my dining room table and also to use household items. It was, there was something, it was very similar to giving my collage class on Zoom, which I thought could never happen. It was always very in-person. So I think that was the biggest challenge, one of the big, one of the challenges. Another one was working on wood and working on metallic grounds. I think it's over, but I, I, it was a good, it was a good year and a half for that. Well, thank you so much, Harriet Fink. It was great. There will be time for more questions at the end of the two other sessions. And we're moving on to my dear colleague and friend, Judy Joseph. He's a Chicago-based artist whose work is exhibited internationally. Her conceptual art practice is paired with work as a calligrapher and illustrator and art instructor. She has had numerous solo and two-person shows in the US and Canada. Her work is in many public and private collections. She holds a BS in art from the University of Wisconsin. Judith, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Dorit. Um, before I share my screen, I just want to point out that I took down the uh, graphic background so that you can see my studio because I feel like I'm taking off the hat of host for a moment to be a participating artist. And I also have a piece behind me that I'm gonna talk about in a moment. So I wanna thank the Jewish Art Salon and my team, but most of all, my colleague and friend Dorit, who is brilliant and creative and an absolute joy to work with. So thank you, Dorit. I'm going to begin with the voice of the bell. This is a recent work. Uh, it was created for an upcoming exhibition, The Samaritans, a Biblical People. It was, the exhibit was sponsored by Yeshiva University and curated by Professor Stephen Fine. It will be at the Museum of the Bible in Washington, DC in the fall of 2022. And I believe there are nine of us, nine or 10 of us from the Jewish Art Salon who are in this exhibit. Who are the Samaritans, you may ask, I asked. The Samaritans are a group who branched off from the Jewish people a long time ago. They live mostly in Israel. They have their own alphabet and language, a sort of proto-Hebrew and their own version of the Torah. Their most important holiday is Passover and their self-defining act is sacrificing a lamb on Passover. This piece was inspired by a story told by a Samaritan woman, Badri Cohen, to Professor Fine. Her grandfather back in the day was preparing for Passover and there were no sheep to be found. He was searching the whole village and the sun was about to set and he was in a panic because he could not find a sheep to sacrifice. And suddenly he heard the tinkling of little bells and over the hillside came a shepherd with a flock of sheep and a miracle happened and he was able to acquire a lamb to sacrifice on Passover. And this work was born from that story because I thought about the voice of the bell as it calls us to our faith and to our heritage and the legacy of the commandments. And here the bell speaks through the cut inscriptions on strips of lamb skin. 
The phrases are from Exodus chapter 12, in which we are commanded to celebrate Passover, and they are inscribed in Samaritan. And you can see that there are little cutout letters that came out of the strips, and I incorporated those into the piece as well. And I did incorporate actual bells, so the piece does have a voice. I formed the bell itself from sheets of copper, which I embossed using the repoussé method. I drew flowers in the center, and you can see them. They are kalaniot, which are the beautiful red anemones that sprinkle the hilltops of northern Israel in the spring. And all the plants that I drew on this copper bell are actually native to the region of Samaria, where the sheep graze on them, and the Samaritans find their sheep for their sacrifice. So it's, it's all very um, integrated. Now, I'm interested in history and heritage, but I also take inspiration from the news. As Jews, we remember that the welfare of the stranger is mentioned 36 times in the Torah. As in Exodus 23, you know the feelings of a stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I saw so many photos of little kids and babies wrapped in these silver mylar so-called shock blankets on the shores of Lesbos and Greece, and also in our own uh, southern border in Texas. And these blankets are really good insulators, but they are intended to be worn over warm, dry clothing, which none of which was provided to these people. So they basically just were wrapped in a sheet of plastic. The little, little kids were in wire cages in Texas with concrete floors and air conditioning, nothing soft and warm and fuzzy, just these plastic sheets, which to me was absolutely heartbreaking. <coughs> I decided to make a onesie out of this cold material. This was constructed according to a pattern, and it even has the little round snaps that you see on a onesie. For the designs, I made decals from the faces of crying refugee babies. It was displayed in Berlin in a group exhibit called I Am an Immigrant, curated by Dorit Jordan Dotan. I used the same shock blanket material for this more elaborate piece entitled, Marie Antoinette visits the border. And I'm sure you can all figure out why I titled it that. I followed a costume dress pattern, and I also referred to historical paintings of the period for accuracy to get, make the gown exactly correct. The blue cloth on the floor represents a body of water, which immigrants are usually compelled to cross at their peril. There are half deflated child-sized flotation aids on the blue cloth and flowers such as one throws in memory of the drowned. Marie wears a necklace of barbed wire and it's used barbed wire, it's nice and rusty. That was something I was able to get on the internet. <laughs> Her gown is trimmed with ruffles. She is embellished with bows. From afar, the gown is pretty and enticing, but when you come close, you can see that the designs are a repeat pattern of exhausted refugee parents holding their babies, also a border of a crying toddler. And this particular crying toddler, the photo was all over the internet and uh, was very famous or infamous. Now, I noticed from the Facebook page of the Cone Line Museum where this was first exhibited, that people love to take their photo with Marie in her luxurious gown. There were several of these different groups but you can sort of see the unease on some of their faces, which is just what I'm going for. And these two works are currently on display at Northern Illinois University Art Museum's exhibition, Refuge, Refugee. And it's kind of interesting because the way he positioned the works, Marie is staring directly at the onesie, which I think is very unsettling. Jewish Art Salon Open Studios programs, which I have been working on for over a year now, they provide inspiration to me. I hope they inspire you. And I'm so glad to see everybody here today. This image was from Israeli artist Eleonora Schwartz's video, Black Coffee, and it really stuck in my head. It was shared with the Jewish Art Salon by artist Yehudas Barmatz, who was in a group show with Eleonora and others in Israel called White Moon Black Coffee, and it was curated by Avital Vexler. I make a lot of woodblock prints. This is probably my primary medium right now. When the pandemic started, the picture that came into my head 
was the coronavirus looming like a Godzilla monster over the Chicago skyline. Joel, this is for you. <laughs> I was thinking of you with Godzilla. I pictured it as a head spewing an endless stream of black liquid, really a skull. And Eleonora's black coffee was undoubtedly the inspiration. The dolphins that you see on the bottom are a reminder that the pandemic had a silver lining. The natural environment improved temporarily from the shutdown and quarantine. There was less pollution in the ocean and in the air as factories closed and there was less shipping and traffic. I do like drawing bones. This woodcut is a memento mori, a contemplation of life and death. For me, even though it's Halloween, the skeleton is not morbid. This is an homage to the marvelous inner architecture we walk around with that supports us. And this may be because I was raised by a doctor and a nurse and a lot of medical things were talked about in my house growing up and they weren't horrifying to me. It was a miracle of life and biology. This piece is called Tied to Life and it was inspired by the creative work that we do that keeps us going into old age and also becomes our legacy. This is a steamroller woodcut. It's five feet by 30 inches. I love to attend steamroller printing events and make huge prints. And actually that's what got me into woodcut printing. My first one was a five foot block. Inner life of a golem was shown in the 2017 exhibit, The Golem in Brooklyn, curated by the Jewish Art Salon's own Shoshana Brombacher and including mem many members of JAS. The text here is from the morning liturgy how great are thy works, O Lord. Thou hast wrought them with wisdom, but wisdom is left off because the golem wasn't such a great idea. And that's what happens when man plays God. Another woodcut, Soul Accounting, features my personal avatar, the owl. Actually, I love birds generally, and I relate with them. And this is a contemplation for Yom Kippur. We look within and tally up our virtues and vices. I pictured my soul as a series of owl-shaped matryoshka dolls. Some are shining and glowing, and others are cracked and flawed. Lest you think that I only work in black and white, until recently I was all about the color. This is an earlier version of soul accounting in egg tempera, with copper repoussé borders. And I also am a ketubah artist. The ketubot and calligraphic works and commissioned paintings that I do support my artistic practice. This is a, an original work in the sense that I did the lettering by hand as well as all the painting. Calligraphy has trained my hand and it is present in my brush work when I paint. I teach watercolor at the Chicago Botanic Garden, and every beginning class, I teach a class on sumier, which is gestural painting, and it's related to calligraphy. As you saw in the golem print, I sometimes incorporate lettering into my imagery. As I said, birds are important to me. I was invited to, an ex to exhibit in For the Birds at the Freeport Art Museum in Illinois. I wanted to create something that was off the wall, literally, and hung in space like a bird. This is a two-sided piece, about five feet tall. It's collage, acrylic, and ink on Tyvek. It's called Crow Diary. And Tyvek is the material that they use to wrap houses. It's that white stuff. It's plastic, but it actually has a surface that's like rice paper. It's very nice to paint on. And the collage elements are cut up woodcuts because any printmaker knows that not all the prints come out well. So I have been repurposing them in this way. This is how the piece looked in the gallery so that you could walk all the way around it. Um, it was a beautiful show, by the way. It was just absolutely wonderful. Um, the piece, this piece was acquired by a birder who lives on a bluff overlooking the Mississippi River. So I love the idea of her looking out at the birds and my birds looking out at them too. I leave you with a detail of Crow Diary. Like this bird, my avatar, I am watching and waiting for creative ideas to hatch in my studio. Thank you.
Wow, Jody, that was like a big wow, fantastic. All your you. skills there in this just 10 minutes. And you get so many compliments and wow and awesome. But you're going to read all about it. I didn't see any questions. I have to say that uh, the Samaritan piece is it's just fantastic. I, see, I want to see it in life, actually. And the materials and everything, I know the process. And it came out just gorgeous. And so thank you so much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you listen to it. Can you hear them? Yeah. <laughs> so it does, it does make a noise if it moves. Right. And you know that your woodcuts are my favorite medium. So it's just amazing. So thank anybody, so everyone, please jump in if you want to ask Judith. Talk about the process for doing this, uh, the leather strips on that piece. They're laser cut. So um, I had to prepare a digital file and uh, Professor Fine, uh, present, he um, gave me actually a Samaritan alphabet, which I was able to upload to my computer. And uh, also the, I was able, he, he, he gave me the specific phrases in Exodus that I wanted that command us to celebrate the Passover and, and make the sacrifice. And actually, um, I don't read Samaritan, <laughs> obviously. So he, he chose the verses that I needed. And I had those um, laser cut into the strips. And then what happened was I noticed the little letters that came out were so cool. They were so perfect. So I, I thought I should really use those. So I actually very painstakingly glued them onto um, fishing line, which is pretty much uh, invisible. So they kind of float in air, uh, which was fun. It was a lot of fun trying new things. Hannah, Hannah you can ask your question. Just jump in. Hi, Hannah, Judith. Can... This is just, I. I... This is going to stay with me for a long time. I, um, I want to talk just specifically about the mylar pieces, um, especially the onesie. I mean, it just had me in tears, like instantly. It just brought tears to my eyes. So I, I was wondering because it's so powerful, how you can manage to when something is that emotional, like just gut wrenching. Are you, do you um, have to kind of compartmentalize and kind of separate yourself from it so that you can manage it? It's just, it, it, it's so um, sort of destabilizing. So I was just yeah. wondering how you managed to actually do the work technically while you're just having all these feelings. Well, you said it and I cried when I did that piece especially just cutting the pattern pieces out. And also the Marie Antoinette um, with the onesies, on, I mean, the floaties on the river and the flowers, it was very emotional, but it was, diff it was a, they were both very challenging and difficult pieces. You can't sew mylar, it would just tear. So I had to experiment how to join the pieces together, um, which was really challenging. So once I got into the technical parts of trying to put little baby snaps, you know, on mylar, you know, I, I definitely was focused on that, but it's still very emotional for me. And um, I really, one of the aesthetic things that I really choose in my work is the one, two punch of let's lure the person in with something that's really pretty and then give them like a, well, you know, like a impactful emotional response, because um, I'm not afraid of beauty, beauty and decorative quality in my work. I mean, I make ketubo and I make a lot of things that are, you know, pretty beautiful. Um, but I think that those two things combined are powerful. So, and I was inspired by the way, I want to mention Lisa Rosowski, who's an artist from Boston, who did this wonderful twelve fabric. She, you know, you can make your own fabric now at, um, forgot the name of it, but it's a flower. <laughs> She did a, a toile is like a repeat pattern and she did it um, and you, it looked really elegant. And then you get close and you realize that all of these things, instead of little scenes of French gardens, they're con concentration camps. So she really has that aesthetic in her work too. And that was very inspiring to me. Thank you for the question. Um, I have a quick question, a comment. Um, so thanks Judith. And we've talked a lot. Um, your yeah. final slide of a detail, uh, I wondered, 
I mean, I myself, so this is projecting onto your work a little bit, in the digital age, I take pictures of details and then they become new pieces because I can print them out and go from there. And it seemed to me that that final screen was a complete piece as a detail as well. So I um, love that. Thank you. So I hope, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm moving more into the digital direction. So uh, I'm looking at it on my screen now. Yeah, I would like to print that. Well, it's you can you can print it and then draw back on top of it and make it something right. new. And um, I mean, I have one piece now that has generated about four sub pieces, and I can't even remember sometimes where they came from. And I see that happening in your work. So. Well, I've been paying very close attention to what you do. So. <laughs> oh, <laughs> learning from you. My you too. So it's great. So we have to kind of move on. So one more question by uh, Richard. Did you want to? Ask a question. Sure. Thanks so much. I just have a comment um, uh, relating to painting or making art about deeply disturbing things. I think the only way that one can do it, and I'm certain this is exactly what you did, is you essentially think in your mind that what you're doing is more important than your own emotions. Uh, I did 10 years after 9-11, I did a set of paintings on 9-11 uh, very specifically of falling figures or some photographs that were obviously extremely difficult to look at. But, and also I did a painting on the Fogel massacre in Israel, uh, but, and, you know, look through all the clippings and all the images and, but you just, you're, you have convinced yourself um, that what you're doing is more important than your own emotions. And just, you just, you know, brazenly push through it. And you're absolutely right. Because of course, extremely painful process, but has to be done because that's one half of what art is about. Anyway. And, yeah, and I think that's true with all of our work, whether it's dealing with painful things or not. What we do is we kind of submerge our ego. I mean, that's that's how it works for me. The best work that I do is when I can get my focus off of, off of myself and just let the idea sort of flow through me and I'm the conduit. So I think you said that beautifully. And I, I think that we will move on to Egal, and I have the pleasure of introducing him. So Egal Peruth is our next artist, and he's a Guatemalan artist with a 30-year-old artistic journey with exhibits around the world in Latin America, Europe, and Israel. He always had to communicate himself through art and let it speak about him and its nature. He also had a TV art program called El Vagón. And Igal will present his work, and I'm going to share my screen for him. Thank you, Judith. Good morning, Judith, and Dorit, and Joel, and everybody. It's a pleasure to be part of the presentation here in the Jewish Art Salon. Well, this Thank is you. my my latest work. It's called Variation of a Broken Heart. So here, what I do is I present two realities that are present in any human being: a spiritual world and a mundane world. Uh, the spiritual world, I, like I was mentioning. Uh, you can see the, the sky. These are uh, hand color pictures. And uh, the mundane world, here I present, a, there was an eruption of a volcano here in Guatemala called the volca a, a fire volcano, Volcán de Fuego. Uh, so that uh, volcano damaged, the eruption damaged a lot of houses and killed a lot of people also. So I went, I, I also work uh, with found objects that I learned, uh, one of my master was uh, Roberto Cabrera, a very important artist here in Guatemala. So I use, uh, I find objects and then I place them in the, in the artwork. So here, what I do is um, that through the, only through a heart that has been broken from an excess of ego, light and blessings may come on it. And also there's a duality in which the heart that it's the deferred and also a central sphere that is uh, the Sefirah. Can we move to the next one, please? Okay, so here, uh, last, like I was uh, mentioning, we have uh, the heart and the sphere. The sphere is also a symbol of the heart. Uh, so according to the Kabbalah, uh, the heart or the sphere is the balance between both worlds, the spiritual world and the mundane world. In also always in according to our actions. That is the reason why I frequently use uh, the sphere as a representation of the heart. So here we see that uh, we can see that there are several band-aids and everything. So I always, I always look into the positive side, uh, trying to um, 
uh, to find a, a cure for uh, problems. Here I work uh, with um, acrylic uh, in pasta uh, over wood and I work with mixed media. Next, please. Uh, when, I, when I was thinking about the Genesis, that is uh, this project, I can only remember the book Genesis and how Noah was saved by God because of his humble nature and respect towards an invisible God. 40 days and 40 nights, it rained. Both water gates were open by his will. He had to wait, but he was saved and the world was healed. So this is also a relation with the band-aids that I was mentioning before. On the 41st day, he and his family came out into the healed world again. Next, please. Eagle, can you just tell a little bit people ask during the medium and the size just? Oh yes, yes, the, these size are 90 by 70. And these are work of uh, centimeters. Uh -huh. And these are collage our work. So here we have uh, the sun that it's uh, you know important symbol for any culture. And uh, uh, like I was mentioning here, the technique is with uh, acrylic in past. Um, so always thinking about reset mode, like what happens with a uh, regenesis. Uh, we have the sun cycle and next please. We have the moon cycle also, uh, the seasons, the harvest, the human existence always prevails. Next please. This is a, a very important piece for me because during the pandemic, uh, always Judaism is in the search of light in the middle of darkness in all of its history. In Guatemala, uh, that is a small country in Central America, the pandemic has been uh, very harsh for the people, like, uh, you know, in most of the countries, I understand. And so the press interviewed the rabbi of the Jewish community, and they asked him what the opinion was about his opinion and Judaic uh, opinion about the dark moments like this. And he mentioned a tale about the rooster. Uh, that's that sings in the in the darkness. He mentioned that the rooster was the is the only uh, animal that sings in the darkness. It soon becomes a light in the presence of uh, obscurity. Uh, there is somebody asking right now about the size. It's uh, uh, these sizes. These are ninety centimeters high by seventy centimeters wide. Well, and this is. Uh, can we see the next ones? Please, next one, please. Yeah. Okay, this is also a collage um, that I work. Uh, can, we can also, also see the relation between the spiritual world and the mundane world, also with some lava stones from the volcano that I mentioned. Next. And this is uh, my last piece, I believe. Uh, this is uh, it's all part of the same uh, series. And here I also work something that is very important with me. I work with broken. Uh, with a broken a glass, a broken glass and broken um, mirrors. Because uh, what happens is that when something breaks, it's always important to keep the pieces together uh, to have the, uh, the complete object. And also, also with the, the mirror, you're always uh, projecting mirror-wise with other people. Well, that is, uh, that is all. Okay. Wow, Egal, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Judy. That was beautiful. And I, I was so moved by your work and the way you have a simplicity of imagery and just the way you use it to, in different ways to express subtly different ideas. It's very moving. I haven't had a chance to look at the chat, so I'm going to move over there and see if we have any questions. And while I'm doing that, if somebody wants to jump in with a question for Egal, you go right ahead. Yeah, I just want to say, Igor, that it was very interesting. I love your work. And even though it's based on the Kabbalah, which I can see the connections, I, I cannot not think about the climate change and all that the world is dealing now with. It's, for me, it's really connecting to it. And I can see in each of the images how the, the, how it's, the impact on, the, on our earth 
is is reflected in your uh, work. So thank you. Very inspiring. Thank you, Dorian. Well, I also I always inspire on nature, and I I've been doing studies in Judaism. You know about the Kabbalah and with the rabbis and everything, and trying to always uh, to understand, you know, another way of living and projected in art, yes. There's a spare quality, here, uh, there's just nothing just, extra. Go ahead, who, who? It's Cheslin. Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say that I do really appreciate the Kabbalistic thread. And for me so much uh, as above, so below and the interplay between the two. I, I really deeply appreciate that sacred and profane as you refer to the mundane, um, very close to my heart as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chisholm. Can you talk a little more about that rooster? Because I, I wasn't sure I really heard it all. The, the so, rooster is the only one. The, what did the rabbi say? The rabbi say, uh, well, you know, there's a blessing also with the uh, with the hands and everything. Uh, that, uh, but uh, the rabbi, what he mentioned is that the rooster is the only animal, or in this case, you know, a bird. Uh, you know, I also enjoyed a lot of your work in uh, in your relation with the birds. So this is the only bird that sings at night. In the darkness, so it's uh, it's very interesting, you know, to be able like the Jewish uh, thought always to look for the light and the darkness, you know. With the pandemic, uh, all this crisis, uh, you know, friends being uh, sick and, and passing away, trying to look for for the light between the the, the crisis always. So it's uh, that's the the example that he used when he was interviewed for the press, and it was something always very interesting from from him, from the Judaic uh, thoughts. It's beautiful. So it's really the voice of hope. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Because the dawn is coming. Yes. 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 Any other questions for Egal? I can't see. I, every... I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Joanne, and this is a little bit less about art, but more about Jewish life in Guatemala. Yes. Um, Curious if there is a Jewish community in Guatemala and what are its needs? Yes, there is a Jewish community in Guatemala. Uh, there is a school, there's uh, temples, and uh, there is very active uh, community. And uh, uh, Jewish people here in Guatemala are very active in Guatemalan society. Did they emigrate after uh, the Holocaust? Um, did they immigrate, uh, enter after the Holocaust, or was it? Some, some Jews came before the Holocaust, and some came after. Uh, my my grandmother, she came. Uh, all of my grandparents are, uh, were Jewish, uh, uh, but some, you know, they came before before the war. Yes. Thank you. No, Do you thanks. have a Sephardic community? You know, from the early days of colonialism. Yes, we have a Sephardic coming. We have the Sephardic coming and, uh, and the Ashkenaz coming. Well, congregations, so the, all of us together are the community, yes. Well, I, we're so happy to have you. We want you to bring all your friends next time. Okay. I know you have at least one friend because I met him. Yes, and uh, we also um, have a, an association that is the, the human hand that's called Cadena that work when I mentioned, uh, there was something uh, very beautiful done by the Israeli the state of Israel that donated 39 houses. Uh, when the volcano erupted and, uh, and destroyed the houses, so the, Israel, the state of Israel donated 39 houses and Cadena, the association that is the human hand of the, uh, also. So it was, you know, we're always taking part of helping people in the, in the country. Wonderful. Doreen, I'll just hand it back to you then. Oh, go ahead. Thought I heard somebody about to jump in. I just wanted to say it was wonderful seeing you guys work today. The three of you were really interesting and very accomplished in different ways and uh, tapped in all kinds of aspects, you know, like um, expressionism, conceptualism, abstraction. You know, you kind of ran the gamut, and and you're you're all really accomplished, and it was wonderful that you guys could present today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we were in good company. Uh, Regina, good. did you have a question? Yes. Um, well, not so much a question as a, a thank you and a reminder of the time when Judith brought her art to 
the Northern Manhattan um, art, uh, the Goldwing uh, Art Gallery of the Hebrew Tabernacle, where I'm a volunteer curator, and also the time uh, <clears throat> that the other artist, um, Harriet, huh? also exhibited there. Yeah. Harriet Fink also, and, and Harriet's piece was done on, on, on a drift, piece of driftwood. Um, Harriet, do you remember that piece? Sure. Yeah. And can, yeah. can you, can you talk about it? It was so wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure, I, I did a series, um, actually it was for the Yiddish um, Art Festival originally, Debbie Ugaritz curated with uh, Tina. Right. Um, and it was, I was doing found objects and I was writing uh, the 35 or so uh, sentences from the Torah about uh, being good to the immigrant, not neglecting the immigrant, accepting the immigrant and, um, and the orphan and the widow. And I would write those sentences in Hebrew over and over again on these found objects. And the, the one that you were so taken with was a it was just a piece of found found wood. It happened to be striated, so it was very, very happy to have sentences written on it in straight lines. And then we made a whole show out of it and invited other artists. And yes. this was the height of the uh, anti-immigrant uh, frenzy, just a few years ago. Yes, and, and it, it was, was called. Show, it was called the the strangers among us. Among us. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, wonderful presentation, guys. So that was a wonderful session today with all three of you. Thank you so much, Harriet, Judith, and Eagle. It was fascinating. And you worked together, it was just empowering each other. So I love that. And I would like also to thank our team, the program advisor, Yona uh, Verwer, and our team, Cheslin Ameto and Hannah uh, Wiesenthal Elias. Uh, of course, Judy Joseph curating it with me. Thank you so much. And thank you to Jewish Arts Run and Joel that took Yona today. Um, I want to remind you of next program on December 12th uh, with Jewish Arts Run member Jonathan Hornbridgehausen and Aaron Rosen presenting visual music, calligraphy, and sacred text among Jews and Christians an exhibition of secret calligraphic art sponsored by the Luke Center in Washington, DC. Our next open studio program will continue in January, 2022. So keep, you're gonna get emails and you're gonna see it before. And I wish you a great day and see you later. Thank you. For thank you all for coming. Thank it's great. Thank you. Happy Hanukkah to everyone. Happy Hanukkah. 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 It's coming soon. Yeah. Too soon. And don't eat too much candy today. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.